Hey everyone, this uh, is a continuation of the material that we didn't get to cover at the end of our uh, Monday, January 10th, week one class discussion. Uh, we were having some Zoom difficulties and we got cut off. So this is me sort of uh, going quickly through the lecture notes that I had for the material that remained. Um, we'll be covering a little bit from the J.R.R. Tolkien reading uh, from On Fairy Stories. We'll be looking at Robert, Mac Robert McFarlane, uh, our reading from his book Landscapes. Um, and then I have just a few sort of summary comments uh, that will hopefully put in perspective for you why I assigned the readings that I did this week, some of the, the ways that I hope they might uh, work together, some of the, the insights that I hope you might um, be able to draw together from, from the readings as a group. Um, and thanks again to all of you for your uh, your patience and participation this morning on our, our first go-round. Um, so beginning with Tolkien, I mentioned that uh, the, there's really just one kind of key idea from this reading that I was hoping you would uh, kind of be able to latch on to. Um, and it's it's kind of a an overture towards um, our studies on poetry. The first couple of readings uh, that I assigned really focus on fiction and narrative. Uh, and then with Tolkien, we start to get into a, a borderland between the devices of fiction and the devices of poetry. Um, so on the top of uh, page eight in the Tolkien reading, he talks about the power of adjective, and I will read that quote here. Um, I'll start a little earlier than I did when the, when the Zoom broke down. The human mind, endowed with the powers of generalization and abstraction, sees not only green grass, discriminating it from other things and finding it fair to look upon, but sees that it is green as well as being grass. How powerful, how stimulating to the very faculty that produced it was the invention of the adjective. No spell or incantation in fairy is more potent, and that is not surprising. Such incantations might indeed be said to be only another view of adjectives, a part of speech in a mythical grammar, the mind that thought of light, heavy, gray, yellow, still, swift, also conceived of magic that could make heavy things light and able to fly, turn gray lead into yellow gold, and the still rock into swift water. If it could do one, it could do the other. It inevitably did both. When we can take green from grass, blue from heaven, red from blood, we have already the enchanter's power upon one plane. And the desire to wield that power in the world, external to our minds, awakens. It does not follow that we shall use that power well upon any plane. We may put a deadly green upon a man's face and produce a horror. We may make the rare and terrible blue moon to shine. Or we may cause woods to spring with silver leaves and rams to wear fleeces of gold, put hot fire into the belly of the cold worm. But in such fantasy, as it is called, new form is made. Fairy begins and humans become sub-creators." End quote. Uh, I should say, I paraphrased at the end there, I often do that when I'm quoting older writers, if they use, you know, man or men does this, I'll just sort of neutralize the gender because it doesn't change the meaning. So, I'm completely obsessed with this whole concept. I just absolutely love it. The first time I read this, it blew my brain into little bits and pieces. Um, when you think about greenness as a substance, a power, um, a command in and of itself, above and beyond just being a way to, to talk about the true substance of a thing, you know, being grass, right? Tolkien mentions, you know, the, the mind perceives that this thing is green, in addition to being grass. So 
for a little thought exercise. Pick an adjective, a describing word. Now, if you can, and you might want to, you know, use a little piece of paper if that's helpful, but if you can, use that adjective in a sentence, but use it as a verb. Make it an action word without changing it. Like, don't conjugate it. If the word that you thought of was hot, an adjective, don't say heat or scorch or burn because those are naturally verbs. Use the word hot as a verb in a sentence. Just try and, or, or, you know, pick some other adjective. And as you, as you toy with that, how does it feel? What does it do in your mind? I, um, I'll give an example from, from my own imaginations just so that, you know, we share being on the spot. Uh, I was in a, a class one time, and, and the, I remember watching the professor, it was a male professor, um, was, I don't remember what he was talking about, but in the course of speech, he had to say the word birth, as in having a baby. And he, he stumbled, I saw this flinch in his face, in the muscles of his neck, like it was, he was almost for just a half second embarrassed or something, I don't know what it was, but he, he sort of stumbled in the course of his sentence and talked about birth and it sort of you know it, he had to hold it in for a second before he could get it out of his mouth and um so I ended up writing a a poem about that about this word that represents a process that involves a kind of outbreaking a bursting forth from a person and how it's demanding the idea, the word, like the process is demanding on our courage, our transparency, our vulnerability. Um, and I think towards the end of the poem, I, I said something like, um, the word is not easy to say. It, um, this is out of rhythm, but the last two phrases were, it tugs tendons, brights eyes open. And there I was using bright, the adjective, as a verb. It brights eyes open. And I was thinking about how the professor, his eyes widened a little bit as he was trying to get this word out. But I was also thinking about babies when they're born and how they come into the light and they squint against it and then they open their little eyes. And however powerful the light outside was, the light that you see in their eyes is so much brighter that birth gives life, and in this little infant it brights their eyes open, and in the mum, or in the parents, it, it brights their eyes open into a new awareness. It's like life changes forever. Rambling now, but all this to say, that's one of the, the, the powers that we're going to confront when we're working on poetry. That is poetry at its best. For me, not, not what I wrote. I mean, the way poetry does that. Poetry as an art form, at least one of the big things that it does is it enchants language. It transforms grammar. It opens your eyes, your heart, your mind to completely new ways of, of thinking. I, I sometimes call poetry grammar yoga. Um, because it is, it just it makes you turn yourself into twisty, stretchy shapes in your brain um, and see things differently. Even the musicality of poetry, when it's written in, in rhyme and rhythm, and we call that rhythm meter, because you, you measure syllables, numbers of syllables, stress on syllables. Um, did you know that the word enchantment comes from the French chanter, to sing? Uh, the other word incantation comes from the Spanish cantar, also to sing. Both come from Latin, further back. When poetry causes ordinary speech to ring with music, to sing, it infuses the words and the sentence structure with new power. And that power can transform both the listener and the poet, or, or the reader in the case of reciting poetry. Just going through the motions of that 
grammar yoga, that, that singing language, can change you. Um, so, a, a prelude to our poetry studies. Um, moving on to Robert McFarlane. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do apologize that we didn't get the, to this in the Zoom this morning, but it might be better because hopefully I can do it fuller justice here. Um, Robert McFarlane, in our reading from his book this week, talks about the way that habits of speech, that is, our vocabularies, our choices of words, can shape our habits of perception. He speaks particularly about how this impacts our relationship with the environment and with other living creatures in nature. Um, and I'll just read sort of a few key quotes in hopes of kind of helping you connect the dots from the reading because it it was challenging in its um diction the, the the pitch of language that it's written in um mcfarland talks about how uh he will in this case on page five uh, in my book he's talking about dialect um versions of english that are specific to a, a, a particular community uh, or a region I, my family come from Newfoundland, um, which is, if you don't know, it's a great big island at the easternmost end of, of this country. It's part of Canada, but it uh, joined Canada just as recently as 1950, 49 maybe. Um, and Newfoundland is famous for its dialect, right? A lot of people talk about going to Newfoundland and not being, not having a clue what anybody's saying. Um, but in talking about dialect... Robert McFarlane says, um, these super specific argots, argot means a, a, a sort of topic specific language. These super specific argots are born of lives lived long and labored hard on land and at sea. The terms they contain allow us glimpses through other eyes, permit brief access to distant habits of perception. And he's talking about how specificity in our language um, is the product of diligence in our observation. Paying attention to nuances and detail such that subtle differences between similar things get wider. We view those subtle differences as significant differences and similar things as being still unique, even though they're similar. So, um, coniferous trees, for example. You might hear people talk about pine trees and, and point vaguely at a clump of trees that grow needles. They're not all pine trees. Some of them are pines, some of them are firs, some of them are spruce. And among those differences, there are different kinds of pine and different kinds of fir and different kinds of spruce. You might have some blue spruce and some Weymouth pine and some balsam firs or whatever. I'm just naming trees that I happen to know. Um, but if we're not in the habit of observing the differences, of knowing the meaningful differences between those similar things, we stop naming them. And as we stop naming them, we stop seeing them. It's, it's a feedback loop. But Robert McFarlane is arguing that by reclaiming uh, a specific attentive uh, language or vocabulary, we can also reclaim our capacity to see that specificity. And he has a couple of other good quotes that speak to that. Um, on, uh, on page 11, he says, Precision of utterance is both a form of lyricism and a species of attention. Using precise words is a species of attention. And I've also heard it said that attention is the most basic form of love. I'm just going to let that hang for you to decide whether that resonates with you or not. Um, Yeah, I loved, I loved the quote on the top of page five, where he's giving an example of one, one of the dialect words that he collected in the process of making this book. 
Smews, I think that's how you say it. I don't know. Smews is a Sussex dialect noun for what? What is a smews? The gap in the base of a hedge, you know, a row of bushes, made by the regular passage of a small animal. So you see a little, a little gap made between the branches and, and hollowed out in the grass, and you realize it's a trail where a gopher has been going back and forth habitually. It's a little gopher trail, or a you know, mouse or whatever animal. He says, now I know the word smews, I will notice these signs of creaturely movement more often. And when I read it, I thought, yeah, me too. On the other side, he, so and that's a case where he's talking about reclaiming specific vocabulary can help us reclaim specific um, perspective or vision. On the other side, where language erodes and consequently perspective erodes, he um, says this on page 23 towards the end. The nuances observed by specialized vocabularies are evaporating from common usage, burnt off by capital, as in the concerns of big business that don't want us to know nature too well or observe the impacts that they're having on nature too closely. Um, burnt off by capital, apathy, and urbanization, right? The, the farther we are from nature, the more entrenched we are in our very human-centric urban environments, the less we find, you know, natural occasions to be close to nature, to observe it, to know it intimately. The nuances observed by specialized vocabularies are evaporating from common usage, burnt off by capital, apathy, and urbanization. The terrain beyond the city fringe has become progressively more understood in terms of large generic units, big, big blocks, field, hill, valley, wood. And when I read that, I thought, what are... What are all the different words for different kinds of fields or hills or valleys? I know more words for valley than I do for hill. Valley, vale, dell, holler, ravine. I don't know that many words for a field, and yet I know that there are lots of different kinds of fields. That's so what Robert McFarlane concludes. He says, in, in the process of this erosion of language and, and our consequent erosion of observation, the natural world around us becomes a blandscape. Not a landscape that is known and loved, but a blandscape, flavorless, shapeless, muted. So that is Landscapes by Robert McFarlane fabulous book. Lots of fun words to explore in there if you're um, a lover of particular words. I also have a book that I completely love called Brickle, Nish, and Knobbly, um, which is a treasury of Newfoundland terms for ice and snow. There are more specific words for specific variations in ice and snow formations in Newfoundland than you would ever imagine. And it's because of the working relationships that Newfoundlanders have, have historically had with their environment. Just if you're interested. Um, so, riffing off of McFarlane then. Think about an area in your life where your habits of word choice have shaped your perspective and awareness. Um... And I had some examples in mind. Some of the examples that I was thinking of were, were body words, language that you use for, um, for naming, for anatomizing or particularizing the parts of your body, the quality, qualities of a body. Um, gendered words, the, the kinds of language that we use to 
either refer to men and women or to categorize things or ideas or behaviors as male masculine or female feminine? What about family words? What about the ways that we refer to or define our relationships to people in our, in our family circle? What about the difference between, and, and this is deep in, in McFarland's territory, what about measured words versus hyperbole or exaggeration? Uh, social media, it really, it, it, I don't know what it is about social media, but it, um, it trends language. It sort of funnels our use of language, I find, towards exaggeration, towards hyperbole. Everything is so very. Everything has exclamation points or caps. Um, when I was growing up, oftentimes as kids, you know, we'd, we'd come upstairs from, from playing and we'd whine at my mom or dad and say, I'm hungry. Oh, I want a snack. And they'd say, oh, you know, wait for, wait for supper. And one of us would say, but I'm starving. And my dad, who knows what's up, would give us this very serious look. And he would say, you're not starving. And we knew to, to smarten up and behave ourselves then because otherwise we'd get a lecture about the difference between you're hungry before supper and what starving really is. He was very insistent that there was something important for, for us to learn, something important in how our use of measured, correct, appropriate, proportional language for these things would shape our minds and attitudes. Um... So think about that and remember it when you're writing your essays because precision of language will serve you very well, not just in life, but also, you know, in grades. Second question uh, springing from Robert McFarlane. How many of you might come from families that speak in some kind of dialect? And I mean specifically, um, like it's English, because I'm sure many of you come from homes where a language other than English is also or is primarily spoken, but how many of you speak a kind of English um, that is specific to a, a particular region or country so that the way that you talk involves specific words, maybe some differences in sentence structure or, or a particular accent or unique pronunciations? Um, I would be really curious, you know, and... Uh, I'm not sure, maybe we can take this up at the beginning of, uh, of next class, because I am kind of curious for how many of you this might be, might be a reality. You may notice throughout this course, uh, you may hear in me a weird kind of like vanishing accent syndrome, where sometimes there are sounds in the way that I speak that just like aren't there at other times. Uh, and that's because there is, there is a Newfoundland accent, a Newfoundland dialect in my home that I, I kind of slip deeper into it when I'm talking to my son or when I'm really excited and getting passionate about something with my mom, uh, you know, but when, I, when I'm speaking primarily with my husband, who's a Mennonite boy from here, you know, it, it tends to, to fade back. Or when I'm in public speaking mode, very proper, it, it fades back a little sometimes. Um, you, might, uh, you might see that. But yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to know, uh, for those of you who do speak dialect, um, do you have particular favorites? Are there words or expressions that you really treasure from, uh, from your home dialect? So, that's Tolkien and McFarlane uh, in a bit probably greater length than we would have got to in, in discussion, which maybe is for the best in the end. Um, quick summary comments. I asked you to work through... The, this particular group of readings this week um, by way of beginning our course together because I think that as a collection they do four things, at least four, but four things that I'm going to talk about. Um, one, I, I hoped that they would help us lay out a kind of foundational network of concepts regarding what it is we're reading um, for when we study, sorry, a foundational network of concepts regarding what it is we're reading for, what we're looking for, when we study literature as art. What do stories do? How, how are stories built? What is the craft of narrative? How does poetry work? 
mechanically, socially, spiritually. Second, I hoped that these readings would provoke at least a few questions to get us going in discussion, and, uh, and I think they, they did. I, I think they probably would have better if we didn't have the connectivity problems we had, but hopefully next week it will be better. Um, third, these texts were laid out in a fairly deliberate order in the syllabus. From my perspective, the first pair of readings, Harrison and either King or Wall Kimmerer, depending on your choice, start with a really zoomed out kind of macro view of what literature is all about, how stories evolve, how narrative works, the function that literary art plays in human and non-human societies. And then they, those two readings, they kind of work us down from that bird's eye view into some considerations of the personal, the particular, even the devotional. Um, like at the end of King's essay, when he says, don't say you would have lived your life differently if only you'd heard this story, because you've heard it now. Um, the second pair of readings, Tolkien and, and McFarlane, I see as being more primarily occupied with the micro, um, with analyzing individual uses of literary and grammatic device, uh, or even vocabulary. And from there, they invite us to sort of lift our gaze, um, and expand our frame of view and begin to see how the whole of a literary work or a literary discipline comes to life. Um, I view those readings as operating, you know, kind of like an intricate grandfather clock or, or in Tolkien's language, some really great soup. Um, the overall work of art, which is also a